Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming today. Uh, we're just going to kind of start off. Uh, my name is Chris, as uh, Lauren mentioned, and here's Becky. Good morning, everyone. I'm Becky Remner. All right. Uh, so this is who we are. We thought we'd just include a little picture so you guys can actually get a face to the voices that you're hearing here. Uh, and this is just going to be a little bit about ourselves real quick. Um, myself, Chris, I've been at Monarch Center for about seven years now. Um, I also work for Monarch Teaching Technologies um, and helped design some elements of Vizzle early on. Um, my chief responsibilities at Monarch School right now, I work on getting uh, more technology into the classroom. I also work on our data system itself too. Um, with getting the new technology into the classroom, it actually equals a lot of uh, trying out new technology, seeing how they work with the kids. Um, and then also once we get technology implemented, uh, creating more curriculums for the staff and how to use that technology as well. Um, and we got Becky here. Good morning. Um, I have been a speech language pathologist at the Monarch Center for Autism for eight years. This year, I've transitioned into a supervisory role. Throughout my time at Monarch, I've worked with students ages three to 22. I've done individual and group therapy sessions for nonverbal students, verbal students, um, lower level students with a functional track, and also some higher functioning students with an academic focus. Um, I have experience with AAC devices and using the technology with all levels of ability. So now in my supervisory role, I'm really working with the associate teachers in order to provide them instruction and training around using communication su supports throughout the day um, and helping them with their specific assigned, maybe math or reading goals and integrating that communication in those sessions. Um, and my email address is below and Chris's was on the other screen. If you'd like to contact us at the end of the webinar, we would um, be happy to answer any questions or give any further information. And don't feel uh, afraid to email. We get emails all the time after these presentations. Um, any questions that you want to ask are fine. Um, and just feel free to email us at those. We'll also include uh, the actual emails in the uh, video that we present. Okay. So to get started, um, my portion of the presentation is really to start talking about the, the visuals that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we're gonna transition into thinking about how we use these visuals and integrate them into the technology that we have. So this is kind of a, more of a background of how we think about visuals and what we need to think about when we're preparing to work on social skills with our children. First, I'd like to talk about the five basic tenets of social skills programming. Um, we know that our students with autism, they want to establish meaningful social relationships. They want to be a part of the conversation. They want to be a part of the interaction. They oftentimes just don't know how. And that's what we need to teach them. We need to teach them the skills to be successful socially if we want them to be successful in the community and in the home and in the classroom environment. We also know that successful social behaviors are not always appropriate social behaviors. Um, I think about this with my own children that, you know, when I'm at home and I know what my child wants, maybe I just give in to him instead of making him say the word or teaching him because I'm, I'm just so fast paced and I'm ready to go. So their behaviors that they're doing are not always appropriate, but they are successful in getting what they need. Um, also, so social success is dependent on our ability to adapt to our environment. And this is a major reason that generalization is so difficult for our students. Um, generalization requires thoughtful and systematic introduction into more environments and situations. And then lastly, social interaction skills are not the equivalent of academic skills. Social interactions are ever changing. You'll never experience the same interaction twice 
as opposed to academic skills, which are more concrete. No matter how you do a math problem, two plus two is always four. But in social interaction, I could have the same conversation with a different person. It's going to look and feel very different based on the environment, the person that we're talking to, the words that are coming out of our mouth. It's it's always going to be changing. And that's why it's so difficult for our students. So next I wanna talk about the root deficit. In thinking about skill acquisition and performance, we can either have the deficit in acquisition. So we think that the child does not possess the skill at an independent level. Um, or we can think about it as a skill performance deficit. The child possesses the skill, but not, does not necessarily perform the skill. And there are many factors that perfect, affect their performance. Uh, motivation, sensory sensitivities, anxiety, um, their ability to um, recall the information, movement differences. And some things that we do at the Monarch School to help with the performance deficit is think about what we're doing in the session. Is our environment optimal for learning? Have we reduced auditory and visual distractions, including the social distractions? Does the student have an effective way of communicating their answer? Um, have we provided the appropriate visuals or their AAC device or anything that is going to help the student make her his or her needs and wants met or give them the ability to answer the question appropriately? Are the student's sensory needs being met proactively? And we have a great occupational therapy department that helps us think about the sensory needs of the student and what we need to get them ready. Um, we also really think about our materials. Have we clearly presented the materials to the child where they can understand what we're talking about? So there's many things that we do in our school to tease out whether this is a performance deficit or an acquisition deficit. Um, and we definitely will consult with the different um, professionals we have in the school as well as the parents, because a lot of times a student can do a skill in the home environment, but then when they get to a larger environment like a school where there's more people, there's more things going on, they don't perform the skill and they don't perform it independently. So we really need to, to use our resources to figure out if it's the performance deficit or do we need to help them with the acquisition of the skill. Okay, so moving on to why are visuals important? Most students with autism spectrum disorders have difficulty processing the information auditorily. I have recently had experience with a student who had a two minute verbal processing delay. So if you said hello to him or you gave him a direction, you would sit and wait for two minutes for him to process the direction and carry it out, which can be a very uncomfortable amount of time to wait for somebody to understand the information and move forward. But if I gave him a visual of his direction, he very quickly carried out the direction and was successful. Visuals also have staying power. Social interactions are fleeting. Um, you have an interaction and then it's gone. Our words are gone in the air um, and we have a memory of what happened, but then everyone has a different memory of what happened. Everybody has a different perspective. So the visuals definitely have staying power. Um, also visuals give more information than speech alone. If I tell you I went to the park today, it gives you 
some very vague information and you might come up with a schema in your mind of what a park looks like. Um, but if I give you a picture of the park that I went to, you're, you're able to really see what I saw. You're able to understand that there were other kids playing in the park, which I didn't mention. Or you're able to understand that they have swings and they have slides and what a park can look like or be to different people. Visuals are also more concrete. There's nothing that the student needs to interpret about tone of voice or sarcasm. Nonverbal language is an ongoing struggle with individ individuals on the autism spectrum. And when we use the visual, we take those pieces away, giving a more direct way to communicate with them and to help them understand the information. And visuals can also help decrease anxiety. Um, they give the most information and they give the learner something concrete to hold on to and to refer back to. Okay. So in thinking about our visual supports, we need to think about some different things in order to create what we want and what's going to be effective. We need to determine where and when and in what context or activity we want to utilize a visual topic board or folder. Um, we need to determine our objective for what we want the student to do or your child to do at home. If you take the example that you would like your child to participate in a conversation at the Thanksgiving table, you might want to um, think about, well, okay, I want my child to ask and answer questions with Aunt Joanne. So you're going to start modeling at the dinner table. You want to determine what type of visual topic board or folder that can best meet the needs of the student. Maybe your child needs more of a script of questions and comments that they can make to have that conversation with Aunt Joanne. Or maybe they just need a visual of, it's my turn to talk or it's your turn to talk. Each student is gonna be different and the visual they need in order to elicit the expressive communication is gonna be different. And using the visual, you wanna provide a model for the student. Just giving the student the visual is not always going to make sure that they use it appropriately. We need to teach them how to use the visual first. And at Monarch, we think about our visuals in three different ways. So this brings us to talking about them, bomb, and them. So VIM would be our visual instruction mode. And these are visual cues that we use for the purpose of comprehension, which are as an alternative to or in conjunction with speech. So remember that the visuals have staying power and the student can reference these visuals over and over again to enhance their compre comprehension of the materials we're trying to teach them. And these are some examples of visual instruction. First, I have a how to brush your teeth activity story. So step one, wet your toothbrush with water, apply a thin layer of toothpaste. Here they can see a picture of someone putting the toothbrush, toothpaste on the toothbrush. Here they're going into a little more detail. Start with your upper back teeth, left side, outside surface, and brush each tooth in a short circular motion for 10 seconds. And in this instructional tutorial, they're really focusing on having the students, um, instead of just completing the task, they want to make sure that the student is, is doing it effectively and um, and doing it thoroughly. 
For some students also, this may be an okay level of language. For some students, you may need to tailor back how much language you use. Is your student going to understand upper back teeth, left side, outside surface? Um, some will, and some will need a little less uh, words in the, in the um, instruction. So here we go through the different steps of brushing teeth, being thorough. And these are all very specific pictures of what these, the language in the steps mean. Inside surface of lower front teeth. I can see what exactly I'm supposed to do. And then rinsing also. So this takes you pretty um, specifically through brushing your teeth, whereas some kids may need turn on the water, put toothbrush on your toothpaste on your toothbrush, brush, rinse. And that might be the extent of what you're teaching. Sorry, I'm trying to go back to the original PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Another example here of visual instruction is our dress buddy. A lot of the teams use this in the morning in conjunction with their calendar and weather. Uh, it's a nice interactive visual for use on the smart board. So the students can see that the weather is raining today. So they would dress the boy appropriately for going out in the rain and, um, and teaching those skills with the visuals. Okay, so, so the second way we think about visuals is in visual organization. And typically when we think of visual organization, the first thing that comes to mind is a visual schedule, either a visual schedule to uh, organize their whole entire day or to organize the session. But visual cues in organization can be an activity, a routine or a script as well. So here we have a, um, a very detailed schedule of what the Lake Erie Monsters hockey game would look like and what we're supposed to do at the hockey game and how long it's gonna take. This is very informative to the student, the event. We're going to the Lake Erie Monsters hockey game. It gives us a where, so the student can know the location. Maybe they need how long it's gonna take there to get there as well. The who, who's going, what we're gonna do is more of the micro schedule of the game. So we're gonna drive to the game, wait in line, find our seats, watch the game. Maybe a student needs to take a break and watch more of the game and drive home. This gives information about how long we're gonna be there and also a reward. So we can eat a snack, we can play a game, see the mascot, watch the dancers. So those things might be motivating and they can choose one in order to end their schedule. This is another example of visual organization to organize a conversation. So here, the first thing we're gonna do is say hello and say the person's name. Hello, Aunt Joanne. And then the second thing is to ask a question about the other person. And in here, it's really nice that the third thing that we're supposed to do is use good listening skills. It's telling the child, we need to make eye contact. We need to listen, not interrupt. It's the other person's turn to talk. And then make a comment or ask a question about something the person just told you. Um, so this is a nice way to get a nice conversation, maybe at the Thanksgiving table.
Okay. The third way we think about visuals is in the area of expression. This is any visual cue used for the purpose of expressive communication. For nonverbal students, this may be in the form of using their augmentative device. For verbal students, which we often forget that just because a student is verbal doesn't mean they don't need visuals in order to help them retrieve the words they need to express clearly how they feel or what they need or make a comment about something that they see. And for verbal students, the most common visual we use is a topic board. And there are a few types of topic boards that we can use. First, um, I'm going to talk about a static topic board. This type is a printed page. They can use the board as a visual support to produce language. Students or staff can point to the visuals on the board, and the board can be organized in a few different ways. So we can do by parts of speech with single words. So a student may be able to go from left to right across the board and create a sentence, I want to eat the chips, or by whole comments. So maybe one of the boxes on the topic board would be the whole phrase, I want to eat chips. And this is a example of one type of topic board. This is a single word and it also has phrases, yes, no, maybe more. And you can use this at the holiday table to say I'm thirsty or uh, I'm hungry please, can I have the mashed potatoes? So maybe they just need these little prompts in order to elicit requests or answers to questions. Here we have a similar type. This is more of a conversational type flow. At the top, there's greetings. So different ways to say hello. How's it going? How are you? Excuse me if they're interrupting a conversation. And these are some different conversational starters. These are some typical things that you might talk with somebody at the Thanksgiving table with. Um, with Aunt Joanne, how are you doing this weekend? And then there's some things that if Aunt Joanne would ask the students the question back, there's some choices of answers. I could think I could even use one of these at the next one. We're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> okay, another type of topic board would be something more manipulative. So the board is set up so that the components of the board can be moved or arranged. And this type of board stems from the use of PECs, can be a nice step up from PECs for students who are ready to expand their utterance. So maybe the, um, the board that I was talking about that has, I want to eat the chips, um, can be movable. So they're moving the I down to the sentence strip. They're moving the want down to the sentence strip and they're building their sentence um, and they're able to provide that movement of the icons. Other types of topic boards include topic folders or flip books. They can be made to expand social language, to create multiple communicative turns. They can be set up to include different phases of a conversation. First, you're going to do greetings, then you're going to do some comments or questions, and then you're going to do partings. And the staff may also need to provide students maybe with a visual schedule of how to progress through the visual folder. And in the next slide here, I have an example of one of the folders I've used for my students in a group. And this was really nice when we did weekend update. So the in the top left-hand corner, you'll see the visual that was on the front of the folder giving a greeting. Hello, Miss Liam, how are you? 
And then they open up the folder and it's the blue boxes for the initial questions. What did you do last night? And then when I would answer, a follow-up question in the green could be, how was it? Or did you like it? And then closing the folder on the back would be the bottom left-hand corner, a couple different ways to say goodbye or end the conversation and see you later, talk to you later, those kind of things. If you're using a visual schedule with this folder, you could label each page one, two, three, and four, and maybe your visual schedule will go number one. So you want to say something from the first page, number two, number three. And if you want to expand the conversation, you may do another two, three, and then four to say goodbye. So then you've got two conversational turns uh, that the student's participating in. This next one I've used as more of a flip book, again, in a group that we did some weekend update and some morning meeting types of things. Here we had a student would be presenting what he or she did over the weekend. And to the rest of the class, I could hold up a red visual on a popsicle stick. So if I hold up the red visual, the students know that the red means questions. So they could pick one of the questions to ask their peer. If I held up a blue visual, they would know they'd go to the blue page to make a comment. Okay. And then more recently, we've been using more scene displays for our topic boards. And these are pictures that represent an entire event or activity. They give background context. They give agents, objects, actions, and the interactions between the two. We can do them dynamically in video clips, or we can use static scenes that are digital photographs, so they capture a single prototypical moment in that activity. And down at the bottom, I have smaller pictures of what you'll see here. This is visiting the grocery store. And these I took off of Autism Eat, which Chris will talk about in a few minutes, but you could also create something like this on paper. Um, if you're visiting the grocery store and you want to um, say hello to the cashier, you might point to the cashier or you might point to the Reese's peanut butter cups in order to request those. If there's somebody else in line, you could prompt the student to say, excuse me. Many different ways to use this. And here we have a picture of a bedroom and requesting activities. Um, there's the blanket, there's the TV. We could ask to turn the TV on um, and we could talk about the different items and actions in the bedroom that the student is to participate in or maybe you want them to make their bed. Um, and with Autismate, it's really nice. You could even click on the bed and have a nice um, sequential instruction of how to make the bed. Okay. So now I'll hand it over to Chris. He'll talk about more of making these visuals and how to make these visuals and then transition it over into the technological side. Yeah, with the visuals, uh, one of the ones that we tend to talk about the most and just in the sense of creating visuals in an, ad, in an analog sense, so paper, pencil, all that type of fun stuff is BoardMaker. Um, and the reason why we talk about BoardMaker is just because of the fact that BoardMaker itself is kind of the, the most well-known uh, visual creator out there. Um, it can be expensive. And if you break those CDs, it's, it's expensive to replace them. Um, but they have such a great library of pictures um, that you can pull from, and it's pretty easy to create visuals uh, with that. Um, one of the ones that we also talk about is Vizzle. Uh, the reason we talk about Vizzle is because it grew out of Monarch Center for Autism. 
Um, myself, I worked on it early on, uh, and then I came back to the school. Um, but Vizzle is essentially software that is uh, takes all these visual elements and it puts it in the hands of the teacher. So basically you can create from templates, visual activities. So things like stories, matching boards, um, sequential activities and schedules. Um, recently too, and I'll get into it in a moment, we just actually added a very new component, which actually has a lot to do with what we're talking about. Um, let me click ahead here. Oh, all right. One of the cool things about Vizzle 2 is they've added a Vizzle player. Uh, the player is essentially any of the components that you create on Vizzle, you can then open them up on an iPad or an Android device, and you're able to then take these visuals and put them in the hands of the students, uh, which is really powerful. Um, when I first started working for Monarch Center, uh, we got a bunch of tablets in. This was back in like 2006 uh, for, for this project, but back in 2006, we got these tablets in that were very basic tablets. Uh, they were Windows tablets and they didn't have very much space on them. And we, we tried to see which ways we could use these with the students. So it was even before iPad days and all that. Um, but one of the things that we wish is all these visuals we were creating, we wish we could put them on there and that we could have access to them and make them more engaging. Um, and so with the advent of the iPad and then also tablets after that, um, the applications have become more well-developed. Um, Vizzle itself is very well developed and allows you to take those visuals that you created and then put them right on the iPad for the student to be using. So talking about that template they added recently, uh, they actually just recently added a topic board. Uh, topic boards, as uh, Becky was talking about here, they are a great way to start conversations with students. Um, it allows teachers to create open-ended communication experiences with them. And what's really great is you can customize this to any way you want. Um, this will also just added a component where you can integrate with Google Images. So you can grab images right from Google and pull that into the projects that you're creating for the students. So it's really great. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do a demo. Let's see if I can, let me see here. <laughs> I do. No. Okay. I do my desktop. Okay. So we're going to try a web browser and see if we can. Okay. All right. So this is the GoVisual website here. And Becky's going to log in for me real quick here. Cool. All right. So this way I can actually show you guys off a little bit of the top of board. Now with the topic board, uh, where I'm gonna be loading it from is Vizzle's library. Vizzle has a huge library of already created visuals. So it kind of really helps us out with this. Uh, so. Okay, so I'm just gonna go to activity type here and then I'm gonna go to topic. That way we can just see all those. So I watched this one earlier today. This one's about feelings. And we're just gonna go ahead and start. Okay, so from here, you can see how you can actually create a top board. Now for this one, we have walk next to the shade tree. So the student can actually drag from below here up to the sentence strip at the top. So if they actually drag the walk and we get the next two, and then we get the the. And we'll grab the shaded tree here. You can see how you can create a top board just like that. Okay. 
And there we go. Um, now, again, Vizzle already has a bunch of these created, but you can create this yourself and you can customize it, adding your own uh, images and uh, text and stuff there. Okay. Uh, so in talking about some of the applications and stuff that you can use on the iPad with a uh, topic board, uh, one of the ones that uh, Becky had created here is for Toka Hair Salon 2. Uh, Toka Hair Salon 2 is a very engaging app because it, it's fun for the kids. And I think that's one of the most important things. Uh, when children or uh, others enjoy it, they're more apt to actually use it and then learn from it. Um, but it teaches a lot of basic skills such as color, um, cause and effect, um, and it's great for them. So here's an example of a topic board relating to that. And this is one example that was building the sentence. So the student could point to, I cut pretty hair, or I cut with scissors. So here you're, you can teach concepts, you can teach commenting, and you're also interacting with the child while they're using the iPad. A lot of times our students really like to use iPads for choice time or for downtime, and they're they're sitting with it and they're playing these things and not interacting and not learning from these things. These are very motivating things. And back to what we were talking about with the, is it a performance issue? Because it's not motivating. This can be very motivating in order to teach those skills. And here's an example of another app, uh, kind of cause and effect, but also teaches a lot of fine motor skills such as tapping, pinching tilting, twisting. So for our OTs out there, this is a really good one to kind of teach a lot of the different finger movements. Uh, each recipe also has a variety of sequential steps. So you're learning a lot of sequential steps with that. Um, and also a lot of pre-reading skills as well too. And here's an example of the topic board for that one. And again, it's the same sort of, um, of thing here. You can add in your who, you can teach pronouns with you or we or I, she, he, you could add, um, and who's pouring, who is shaking. Um, and then also with some requests, you could add want to the action. I want to make um, a cookie or a candy, anything like that. Putting the sentences together with the descriptors, the prepositions, teaching the concepts with the iPad app. Okay, so as uh, Becky mentioned, one of the applications uh, that we talk about the most with uh, visual and scene cues is Autismate. Uh, the reason we talk about Autismate in that sense is because Autismate allows you to actually set a scene. Uh, with that scene, you're able to then to add hotspots to it. And when you click on those hotspots, you're able to actually see uh, what you could say for that location or what's going on there. Um, one of the cool things that they've added to it too recently is more of a GPS functionality. So you could actually add for like, let's say I'm going to the park or the zoo or something like that. You could actually say, hey, when I go to the park or zoo, let's bring up some uh, scenes for that particular location. Uh, it also has a great ability to uh, add your own content to it too. Uh, so your own pictures and visuals. And I'll get into a lot of that when I talk about the iPads and how to create that type of stuff there. And this is uh, some of the pictures too, uh, just from Autismate's website here. So you can take a picture of like your kitchen or even a, a picture of like the bathroom. Um, my favorite part about it is that you can add video sequences too. So I could say, hey, we're gonna make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the kitchen. And when I open up the cabinet in the kitchen, I can see the peanut butter. I can also then see the jelly and then see what to do with them, how to put them together. Uh, so it gives you those step-by-step -step activities with it. So this all goes into video modeling, uh, which at Monarch we do a lot of. Um, video modeling is a method of teaching uh, individuals by showing them a video um, and then having them follow those same steps of instructions that the person is doing in, the, in that video. Um, basically, there's four types of video modeling. There's basic video modeling, which is someone being filmed doing a task. Um, there's self-modeling, where you have the person who is actually viewing the video having them do the task. Then there's also point of view video modeling where you're actually getting from the point of view of a person doing the task. 
So not just from an outsider perspective, but from what they would actually see themselves. And then there's video prompting, which consists of multiple steps in breaking down the video task. Uh, what you see in Autisme is that you can do stuff like video prompting, but you can basically do any type of video modeling you want through Autisme because you're able to take any of these type of methods or methodologies and apply it. Now, one I'm just recently been talking about and uh, interested in with point of view is that now we're kind of at a point with technology and being a person who's always interested in what's on the cutting edge and what's coming out, that things are getting smaller. Things are, are becoming more wearable, if you will. Um, and wearable is a big topic right now in the technology field. Um, a lot of times you'll see these new things out on the streets now. They're called GoPro cams. Uh, I actually was driving home one evening and I saw somebody on a motorcycle race past me and they had one of these on their helmet. So essentially what this does, it allows you to capture video from the point of view of the person wearing it. So this is popular in a lot of sports right now. Um, also, I was at a wedding recently and somebody was wearing one of these. So kind of going up to people, greeting them at the wedding, kind of seeing the whole conversation in the wedding from a person's point of view. So it's kind of a unique way of seeing your surroundings. Um, as this technology evolves and gets smaller and more wearable, you could easily see a student wearing something like this, um, maybe even as a pure model for, for a program, capturing the video of doing tasks, and then being able to use that point of view video for teaching other students. So with video modeling um, on the iPad or a tablet, I mean, any tablet can really work for video modeling. But I say iPads because that's primarily what we use here at Monarch Center. Uh, we're actually right now approximately at over 100. So we've been kind of really incorporating a lot of them into the classrooms. Um, our SLPs use them individually with the students as well. So we have quite a bit, about, quite a bit of iPads out there. Um, with the iPads or with any sort of uh, tablet, what's really great too is it allows you to have the capacity to store a lot of these videos on there. Um, prior to when I was talking about those old tablets that we used back in the day, those tablets didn't have very much storage. Um, and when you're filming a video, uh, especially on these devices too, it uh, films in full quality, HD quality, that can take up a lot of space. So when I, people ask me about iPads or tablets, which ones to get, I usually recommend probably about 32 gigs now because a lot of these are taking the video in 1080p. So this gives you enough space to store these videos on the computer or on the iPad, and then also uh, space to edit them too. Uh, which is important in uh, creating good video models. So we're going to go into some video modeling examples. So this is an early on video model that we filmed a few years back. Uh, the reason I know it's early on is because my wife's actually in this video. <laughs> I'll let you out there guess which one it is. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll play that back here. Okay, there's one minute left. Start cleaning up, please. So in this uh, video model, you can see that we're trying to show how to do good cleaning up tasks uh, with a classroom team here. In the classroom, the, the team is actually show, serving as the peer model or the peers in this video to show the staff or show the team how to do that. That would have been an example of like a basic uh, video modeling. Up next, we have one from our OT team. There we go. Um, and this is just uh, one on how to wash your hands. It's time to wash your hands. Turn on the water. Get soap. Rub together. What's interesting about Rub this top. too is if you're looking at uh, different types of video modeling, I found that Rinse. when you're doing it, if you 
don't necessarily include the person's face or who the person is. Sometimes Turn off water. It kind of gives more of an outsider perspective of Get the video model out. itself. So these are all just different ty types Run. of video modeling. Throw away. Um, and we won't play this whole one through. This is actually quite long. So Hi. Six minutes. How are you? Uh, and this is actually from a project that we started doing oh, recently. Nice job. We're trying to help you do some fun stuff, okay? modeling using the okay. iPad. I know you're doing such a good job. You ready? Put this under the box. Hmm. I know it doesn't quite fit. It's okay. Nice answering, my friend. Oh. Now let's look on here. Oh. Are you ready? Put this under the box. Nice answering. Hi! These are quiet voices in school. Really that was just an example of one of the video models there. Um, again, what we do right now is we're <coughs> filming a lot of these video models and we actually just got a grant to do some more uh, for staff training and stuff like that. Um, so in talking about video modeling, um, also another aspect of it that isn't really touched on that often is video mod modeling through teleconferencing or think of teletherapy. Now for 10 years, about 10 years ago, when video conferencing just started coming out, um, it was a big thing and it was equipment that filled a whole room. Um, I did my undergraduate at John Carroll, and I remember being in some classes where we did uh, video conferencing, and their equipment was a closet full, and it was a big projector and a bunch of cameras and stuff in order to get the whole room. Now, with the way that mobile devices are going, uh, you can easily use Skype or Google Chat or FaceTime or any of that technology to actually do teletherapy uh, right there from even in the room or another room or across the country. So with the iPads, one of the ones that we talk about is FaceTime. Uh, and the reason we talk about FaceTime is because it's built right in the iPad, so it's easy enough to use. Also, FaceTime does use heavy encryption. Uh, so for a lot of the uh, uh, campuses out there like ours, which is HIPAA compliant, uh, you need to make sure it has heavy encryption on it. That way, anything that you're doing or putting out there is encrypted. Uh, FaceTime also allows you to do video and audio, call, uh, audio calls at the same time. So if you just need to do an audio call, you can have to. Um, one of the things that uh, we actually started working with a student, particularly on this, who a student who was having difficulty in one of the classrooms. Um, and so she required to be worked with in a one-on-one -on -one classroom. And we were talking about how can she make requests from other people who may not actually be in the room. Uh, and so we started talking about using FaceTime to assist with this, setting up an iPad in the classroom, creating a visual contacts for all the staff members. And then the staff members have iPads throughout the room. When she taps on the uh, staff member's picture, it will bring up a FaceTime call for that staff member. And she can speak to that staff member, request that they come in the room and they exchange out the staff member that's there. And then they can then work and talk with that staff member. So it's creating a conversation uh, with those people and teaching the students to make good requests as well. Um, so some recommendations for using uh, FaceTime for video modeling. Um, this can be done either, as I said, in a room uh, or remotely with the student. If you're doing the FaceTime video modeling in a room with a student, I usually recommend to mute sound on both devices. Uh, the reason why is uh, with iPads or with any other device, uh, when you have two devices in one room and they're both recording audio, you tend to get an echo effect. Uh, we were actually just talking about this before this presentation because uh, I guess one, during one of our presentations, we got some bad feedback uh, with lots of sound echoing. Uh, we're calling it the cone of silence. <laughs> that was for you, Jeff. <laughs> 
If you're doing uh, it, if you're doing uh, this remotely, though, I do recommend turning up the volume as high as possible so that all the other people in the actual presentation or in the actual communication can hear, especially if you're using it with multiple different people. Okay, so video modeling apps. Um, one of the ones that already has some video models built into it is Magic Shoes. Uh, and this is used by our OTs in order to teach good shoe tying abilities. Hey, you wanna see how to tie a shoe? There's different ways of doing it. You already have video instructions built into this, as well as pictures. Uh, this app also allows you to take photos yourself as well too, and you can share them with others. And so this is what it looks like. Gives you little uh, visual instructions and then also gives you videos to walk you through that process. Another good one out there, uh, and I actually probably go into both versions of these, is Puppet Pal HD. Um, sometimes you have that student who you'd like them to learn how to do a task. And maybe, you know, you would love to show them how to do it with their own image, uh, kind of giving almost that first person perspective of them doing it. Um, but it's hard for them to do that. Now, there's different ways you could go about that. You could take video of the student and edit it to try to put it together of them actually doing that task. But that can be very difficult. With applications like Puppet, Puppet Pal HD, you could have the student's picture, their face, on a cartoon character. It's kind of cool. Then you could actually say, hey, we're going to have Sue stand next to the horse. And then you can actually manipulate the picture of Sue moving her next to the horse. You can record your own voice and you can record the video playback of you manipulating that as well. So this is what it looks like. Again, you can take the student's own image and put it onto the cartoon character's face, create a scene, and then record the scene as you like. Now, because the, the app became so popular um, and due to limitations of it early on, they came out with a, a second version of it recently. Um, it's just like the first one, but it has a lot more built-in backgrounds, a lot more things you can manipulate as well, too. Uh, the first one's free. This one's $4.99. Um, both of them are universal, meaning that you can use it on an iPad or on an iPhone uh, at the same time. And this is what it looks like. Okay. Another one we're going to talk about is Model Me. Uh, Model Me Kids is a wonderful set of DVDs that has been out on the market for a while. Um, but they also put out some apps, too. Uh, and basically it shows appropriate behaviors and skills for children with autism. Um, it has audio narration uh, for the slides. So as you go through the slides, you can see how to appropriately act at specific events. Uh, the only thing with this application, you really can't customize it all that much, but you can, uh, if, the, if you're doing some of the ones that are built in, like going to the hairdresser, going to the mall, um, there are appropriate things for the student there. Okay, so video modeling, setting yourself up for success. Uh, I always throw this slide into my presentation. So if you've seen one of my presentations before, uh, I apologize for showing this already again. But I always throw this in there because with any technology, um, it's important to follow this disclaimer. And it's, it's just good to know that when we put technology out there in the hands of our children or you know we're working with them, uh, we have to kind of respect the student and respect the technology itself too because we need to learn how to use it ourselves. Um, if a student's having a particular difficulty and it freezes up, we have to know what to do. So just like anyone teaching a student how to play a musical instrument, in instrument like a violin, it's important to have good mentoring um, and it's important to have good practice with that too. Um, so if you want somebody to learn that instrument, you really have to set them up for success. Um, and part of that too is if you introduce a lot of things early on like videos, games, stuff like that, it is harder to pull somebody away from those videos or games. There are ways that you can limit that, and we'll get into that in a moment, but you really wanna set that up for success for the student. Um, and going into that, the important thing about an iPad or any sort of device is you wanna minimize or restrict it as much as you can. Uh, within the iPad itself, there are an actual restriction settings, and I left the link here in this slide, which is under settings, general restrictions, which you can restrict a lot of the capabilities of the device. You might think, why do I want to restrict them? Well, after having set up 100 something iPads and then having students delete all the apps off them, you might wonder why you might want to set restrictions on some of the iPads. And part of that is that you just want to make sure that you're able to pick this up and use it on a daily basis without having to reset things up or remanage them. So setting some of these restrictions can help, uh, help you focus a little bit more on the actual uh, event 
that you're working on with the student and not so much on the maintenance of it. Another thing is when you have an iPad or iPod Touch or anything like that, you can also restrict the particular app you're using using something called guided access. And this is a feature that is built in under the accessibility settings. This, this actual process allows you to lock an app into place. So usually on an iPad, uh, you can hit the home button, which is that little button at the bottom, and that will take you back to the home screen. Um, you can imagine if you're trying to work with a student on a top of board or something like that, if they tap that home button and they exit out of the actual app itself, this can be jarring and it can kind of disrupt the, the teaching for the student. So with guided access, uh, you can turn this on and it allows you to set a passcode and lock an app into place. And it's pretty simple to use. Um, essentially when you turn on, you can tap the home button three times, it activates it, uh, you set the passcode, and then that app is locked in, in place. When they try tapping the home button, uh, they will get a passcode pop-up that will ask them for that passcode to exit out. What's cool about it too, though, is if you have apps that have particular settings or something that you don't want the student uh, really changing or manipulating, you can actually restrict that by just circling parts of the screen that you don't want them to manipulate or change. And that when they tap that part of the screen, that part of the screen won't work as well. So it's pretty cool. And actually a lot of schools who have uh, moved to some of their testing and stuff on iPad, iPads, actually put this in place so that the students can't exit out of the apps themselves. So taking photos or videos on the iPad. Uh, here I have a nice picture of an individual trying to film a wedding on an iPad. Um, I recently at the wedding I was at saw somebody trying to film part of the wedding with an iPad. And it's always a little funny to me just because of how large they are and stuff like that. And I do a little chuckle to myself, but um, at concerts and stuff I've been at recently too, we're filming stuff on iPads or on iPhones. Um, everything we do nowadays is being filmed. Um, but if you're trying to do this type of filming, you want to try to set yourself up for success with that. Um, and one of the things to think about most is the orientation of it. So if you're holding the iPad uh, in that direction, the up and down direction of it, what's going to happen is you're going to get that vertical up and down video. So really you want to turn, turn it horizontally. And the reason why is because then it makes the video horizontal, um, which will allow you to take up the whole screen. And especially when you're putting something like this on like YouTube or something, you wanna be able to have as much of the area as you can. Also, just like any video editing or video filming, um, the best thing to do is to minimize interference in the background. And one of the best things that you can do for that is not having so much shaking or uh, moving about. Um, and part of that can be solved just by having a tripod a tripod will allow you to put any sort of camera or anything attached to it in a steady fashion. Uh, they actually now make tripod mounts for iPads for about 30 bucks. So you can get them, you can put an iPad up on there. It'll keep the screen steady so it's not shaking as you're filming the video. Um, but also talking about minimizing the setting, if you have any, uh, anything in the background, such as background noises, people slamming doors, stuff like that, it's always a good idea to minimize that as much as possible by removing those things from the scene that you're trying to film. So editing photos on an iPad. You can edit photos on an iPad, yes. Uh, you can also uh, edit video as well too. Um, for photo editing, the iPad has some limited built-in uh, settings. Um, you can find these right under the photo part of the iPad. So if you go to your photos area, you bring up a photo, uh, you can tap the edit button. Uh, from here, you can do some limited stuff such as rotate a picture, enhance a photo, apply filters, remove red eye and crop the picture as well. Um, for removing backgrounds or enhancing them, um, I usually recommend trying to take those pictures off the iPad and do it on a computer itself. Um, for this, there's no better applications than using Photoshop or GIMP. Um, these are both uh, well-known photo editing applications. Um, just because if you're trying to remove stuff from the background, it can be a little bit difficult. However, if you want to give it a try, uh, there are plenty of applications out there on the iPad that do photo editing now. Um, just like Photoshop for uh, computers, there's also a Photoshop Touch for the iPad. This does support layers, cropping, gradients, columns, filters, paintbrush. Uh, so it has quite a bit of editing capabilities. It is not as powerful as the desktop version though. Uh, so these are just a couple of the app, uh, apps that I've seen out there that I've seen people use on iPads and have good success with. So Adobe Photoshop, PhotoForge 4, and PhotoGene. Now, if you're trying to edit video on the iPad, 
uh, video on the iPad actually has uh, a few more limitations of editing than the actual uh, photos. Um, and that's primarily because what you can do on an iPad is you can crop and trim off the ends, so the sides, but you really can't crop from the middle. So for instance, uh, for a presentation or something like this, if this is like something we're posting to the web, you might cut off little areas of um, where we're waiting to do something or something like that because you don't want that to take up so much space. So on an iPad, if you have a video that you're filming, you can cut off the ends, uh, the front and the beginning, but you really can't cut out that middle. Uh, for that, I generally recommend a third party program. And really there's no better one than iMovie for the iPad itself. Um, actually, Apple itself made iMovie free for any new devices that are purchased after the past October of 2013. Uh, so when you're talking about, hey, I'd like to add maybe a caption to a movie or something like that, you can do that really qu really quickly through iMovie. It allows you to pull in your video clips that were filmed directly on the iPad, and you can edit them right there. You can cut out parts, you can add your own audio to it, um, and you can also import other videos as well, too. Another really good one that I've seen people have a lot of uh, success with is Pinnacle Studio. And the reason I recommend this one as well too is because Pinnacle Studio has a lot of what I call getting the video on and getting the video off abilities. Uh, through iMovie, really limited to the videos that you've taken with it and loading the stuff through iTunes. Now through Pinnacle, you can also load the stuff from, from Vimeo, from Dropbox, Google Drive, SkyDrive. So really you can move all of these videos onto uh, the iPad itself from other sources. Um, so if you take a picture on a camera and you've loaded that onto your computer and you put it in your Dropbox, you can then access that right on the iPad itself. Um, this, this application also has a gesturing interface um, and it also has a lot of good, uh, good deal of effects as well too. Um, just like you have a lot of ways of getting on, you have a lot of good ways of getting off. So you can export it off to Facebook or Box, which is a, an uh, application that's a lot like Dropbox and also YouTube as well. And this is what this one looks like. So basically it gives you the timeline functionality. iMovie gives you something similar. It's a timeline where you're able to drag and drop the videos on there and you're able to edit the audio under there as well too. So where do iPads store pictures? Um, this is kind of a common question I get a lot of times like, hey, I can't find my stuff, where is it? Because uh, recently in iOS 7, it can be a little bit more confusing. Um, but if you look on the bottom of your device, and when you go into the photos, there's usually something called albums, and then there's camera roll. Camera roll is actually all the photos and videos that were taken on the device itself. So when you take pictures, you take videos, it's all stored in that camera roll. Um, and it's saved there uh, where you can then use it in other applications. Most applications, like if you open iMovie, they'll say, hey, can I have access to your camera roll? That gives iMovie the ability then to take pictures and videos from your camera roll. So how do you get content on and off an iPad? Uh, if you wish to load video from a third party source or something like that, usually you have to load it into iTunes first. Uh, on a PC, you can do this through iTunes and set up a, a video sync folder. So videos that you want to sync over. On a Mac, you can just load the videos and uh, pictures into the iPhoto library and then sync the albums over to the device as well. Usually this is done through lightning cable or, or, or a 30 pin cable. Uh, once you do connect these up to the computer, um, you can also see the videos and stuff to pull them off. When you uh, have the iPad connected, you'll see something that pops up like a, like a drive, and really it's the iPad itself. And there's a folder under there that's labeled DCIM, um, and this is where all the pictures and videos are stored. From here, you can just drag and drop off those videos to whichever device you wish to. Um, with that content, there's also a photo stream, and this is part of iCloud. Um, this is important to note because this is not where your photos and videos are all stored. Photo stream is just kind of, as I always equate it to, a, as a highway or a transit. Um, it allows you to store your pictures on here for the last uh, thousand pictures or last 30 days. Um, so basically it allows you to take pictures from one device as you're taking them and it'll automatically upload them over Wi-Fi to iCloud. It'll then send those pictures back down to your other devices too. Um, if you have a Mac though, and you have iPhoto set up and you set up Photo Stream through it, it will download those pictures and videos to your, uh, to your iPhoto and it'll store them on there for you. So that's pretty cool. Um, I've also included the notes in here for the Photo Stream if you can ask questions because there's a lot more to it too. 
So photos from a computer. Uh, you can sync photos from a computer to your iPad, as I mentioned. Um, when you do do this, um, these, these pictures and videos that you sync over do come up with something that says event from my Mac or event from my PC. These are particular categories of the pictures. Um, and what's important to note is you can't delete these directly off the device. You have to remove these from uh, the, the device that you sync them from. Um, these photos and videos uh, can be used in other applications as well too. So with all this, when you make uh, or you customize anything on your device, it's always important to back it up. Uh, the reason why is I've seen plenty of devices that get damaged in my time. Uh, and when devices get damaged, if you don't have a backup, you may lose that content. So on an iPad, there's two ways of backing up. There's iCloud and there's also computers using iTunes. Uh, with computers, the pro to that is it's free and it's faster. You're basically backing all that data up to the computer itself. Um, the cons to it is that you do have to remember to back it up. Um, Cause so if you don't back it up for a week, you'll lose everything that you've done that week. Um, if a computer is damaged or stolen, you will also lose that stuff unless you've had it backed up in that time. Um, at our school itself, we do have to back them up to a computer because of the fact that a lot of our stuff has student information in it, pictures, videos, stuff like that. And we can't store that stuff on the third party source due to HIPAA uh, issues and stuff like that. So for all that information, we just keep that stuff locally here on the campus on computer store there. Now with iCloud, um, it is a great way to back up. Uh, and if you, a, if you are an individual, so for myself, my own personal stuff, I have my own personal stuff from the devices back up to iCloud. What's great about this, if I do lose my device or it does get damaged or stolen, um, basically, I can get a new device, sign to my iCloud, everything starts downloading just like it was my previous device, so I don't lose anything. So that is a big plus. Um, with iCloud, you're given five gigs free, but you can always upgrade up to 50 gigs. Um, and you can have multiple devices in your backup, so I can have my iPad, my iPhone, all that stuff back up to iCloud. iCloud also does allow you to synchronize your data back and forth, so that's always good too. Um, just as one other thing here, automatically backups, it does automatically back up all your stuff overnight for you too. Um, if you plug it in, it will do that automatic backup. If um, that first backup always does take a while and restores can take a while too because it has to do all that stuff over Wi-Fi. So we're, get, we're towards the end of our presentation here. Uh, so we have some questions that have come up here. So we're just gonna try to go through them and answer them as best we can here. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. The first question was, where do you get the visuals? And in terms of the things that were shown on the topic boards and on the instructional visuals and organization visuals, typically we use the board maker icons to use those. We also use icons from Vizzle images from Vizzle, and we're also able to get those visuals from Google Images, and also just to take pictures of what you need. Some students don't understand an image or a line drawing of a frog, let's say, but they understand a real picture of a frog. So in that case, you're going to want to either do Google Images or take a picture of the item itself. I hope that answered the question for where do you get the visuals. Also, if anyone has any other additional questions too, uh, we're going to keep going through these. But on the right hand side there, you should have a Q&A question section there. You can go ahead and ask your questions there and we'll go through them. Um, our next one up uh, from Elena is what video editing software do you recommend to add text to video on the iPad? Uh, for that one, I usually use iMovie because I can do it so quickly. So if I'm just on, uh, in a video or something like that, I can pull that video into iMovie and I can add a, uh, a um, text right to over overlaying over the video itself. I can also add a pause in the video if I want to just kind of put that text up there and then come back to it. Um, so it's great for that too. I think this is the same type of question. What was the software in types of topic boards that you set a video and label items? Is that the same? Yeah. 
Um, so again, yeah, any type of labeling or anything like that for videos, we usually use uh, iMovie for that just because it's so quick on the iPad. Any other questions come up? Somebody had said any tips for having child use the iPad for more educational use. They're hooked on YouTube. I get this question a lot. <laughs> um, so you, so once you've introduced an iPad to an individual and they have already used it for YouTube or already used it for games, how do you regain that ground back? Um, because it's difficult to do once you uh, introduced it. Um, it's still possible. Um, usually through those uh, restriction settings, um, what I would do is I would restrict any apps that you can and maybe set time limits on them. So um, on the iPad itself, you can actually uh, remove the YouTube app if you chose to. Um, you can't turn it off directly through restrictions. Um, but what I would do is I would maybe put in guided access for apps that you want them to use and then maybe set a timer for them, have the timer pop up uh, with an alarm when they can use it. And then you would have to manage it by taking them out of guided access and then into the YouTube app. And then maybe put the YouTube app on there for about 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, another thing that I found is a cool trick within the iPad itself. You can set a timer and you can set it to make the iPad go to sleep after a certain period of time. Uh, if you set a passcode on the iPad and then you set a timer on it, what will happen is uh, when it goes to sleep and it pops back up, if they tap the button, it'll ask them for that passcode. So kind of you've limited that time and then it's locked them out. Now, again, I do recommend that um, maybe not so much with somebody who might throw an iPad or something like that, not using something like that because it may cause frustration and they may do, uh, damage the device. And I do have a lot of experience with that as well. My son is four and it showed an interest in getting a tablet and we were very reluctant to do that. But the, the timers and setting the passcode has worked tremendously with him um, in what he's allowed to use, how long he's allowed to use it uh, and doing different educational type games and apps and then going to the ones that he really enjoys playing. <clears throat> uh, one of our questions is uh, who do we contact for Vizzle login? Um, for that, contact Monarch Teaching Technologies. Uh, their website is monarchteachtech.com. Uh, if you are a parent of a uh, student here at the school, I believe you have an access uh, that you can get. Um, if you are not a parent of a uh, student at the school, um, you can get a 30-day free trial, I believe it is, through the website as well. Um, so go through those means. Uh, unfortunately, here at the school, we don't have access to any of the logins or anything like that because uh, Vizzle is through Monarch Teach Tech and it is a separate company. The next question is, would it be possible to email the PowerPoint just to have the resource of the images of the visuals? Yes, on our website, the um, the video and PowerPoint will be posted, so you'll be able to access on the Monarch Center for Autism website. Usually it takes a couple of days for everything to get posted because they do have to edit the video, stuff like that. Um, so it may take a couple of days before it's up there. Um, but they usually send out an email to all the attendees or participants with that uh, information of where it's at. Okay, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, uh, we're just going to uh, put this slide up here as well too. This is a list of Monarch services. I usually include this slide in most of my presentations because it gives an idea of what we do do here at Monarch Center. Uh, we do have a preschool and day program. Uh, we also have a transitional educational program, a boarding academy, adult autism program, uh, 
and residence um, that is called um, the Monarch Boarding Academy. We also do extend school year activities, summer uh, social language program, family training, social uh, family training support and social activities, on-site consultation and therapy, and online resource center as well. And then if anyone needs to contact Monarch for any reason, uh, you can go through our website at monarchcenterforautism.org, uh, or you can call us under any of these numbers here. Uh, and you can also send us mail or contact us through Facebook or Twitter as well too. Uh, Lauren, who you talked to before or who did this presentation uh, at the beginning of it, who started off this presentation, uh, manages all those uh, social media things. So if you need to contact us, she's a good person to go through too. And also at the beginning of the presentation, we gave our email addresses if you have any further questions or comments regarding the presentation. Well, we wanna thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we really had a great time doing this presentation. Uh, if you wanna check out any of the other presentations, they're usually uh, put on Monarch's site of when they're gonna occur. So feel free to sign up for any of those in the future.